welcome. I'm Justice Ingrid Gustafson, and welcome to our uh, fifth Moving the Dial. Uh, this uh, training is an ICWA Part 2, which is a build off of our um, training that we had a few months ago. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items. We'd ask that you put yourself on mute, but turn on your video because we are trying to have interactive uh, discussion today, and uh, it's always nice to see people's faces and know that you're out there and um, participating. So uh, I uh, appreciate all of you coming today. Uh, our group with CIP and the department, uh, Casey Family uh, Programs, um, we all realize that you have very busy schedules and that your time is scarce, and so we have really tried uh, to focus these trainings and make them really productive for you. Um, over today and tomorrow, we're going to focus on ICWA. Uh, it's nuts and bolts, including in, enrollment in a tribe, the role of the qualified expert witness, active efforts, due diligence, notices and transfers, and uh, other uh, key terms that are contained in ICWA. And our, our big overarching goal of this is to uh, improve state and tribal relationships and foster more communication uh, between uh, our courts and uh, the tribes and tribal members and tribal social workers. So um, the last thing we're going to do is we're also going to delve into culturally appropriate services, uh, ensure removal practices are culturally appropriate, and learn how to conduct safety assessments in Native American homes. So uh, we really do appreciate you being here. We hope that this is going to be an interactive and informative uh, training. Uh, we will monitor questions in the chat for technical and other technical issues. So if something comes up, please uh, put it in the chat. Um, we are recording this. It uh, looks like most all of you have your naming convention pretty well handled already. Uh, so it looks like we don't really need to go into that. We are going to get going here because uh, we have a packed schedule. And uh, to start us off today is uh, Brooke Barker Taylor and Heather Webster. Uh, both of these uh, folks currently work in an ICWA co court in Billings. Uh, and so I guess you're going to start us off on nuts and bolts. Is that right? Yes. All That's, right. Yes. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen so you can see our um, PowerPoint that we're going through today. Um, as Justice Gustafson said, we really want to thank you all for being here today. Um, we know how busy you are. and Really appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who were on at our last training, this is part two. So um, we are going to um, today go over placement preferences and diligent search, as well as active efforts. And then tomorrow we will talk about the QEW, the qualified experts, and permanency options in these cases. Um, I think almost all of you were on our training the last time, but are the primary prosecutors in Judge Souza's um, ICWA court in Yellowstone County. Um, and Brooke also serves as the prosecutor on his um, now ICWA family recovery court. So uh, we work primarily in ICWA cases and um, really feel lucky to be presenting today. Um, and we really appreciate the court improvement program and also Casey family. Um, later on, you'll hear from Kelly Sim, and we just appreciate her so much. She has helped us immensely. So, so the uh, last time that we presented, we uh, started off the conversation with tribal sovereignty. And so we thought it was important to bring it back around that that really helps focus the conversation. And one of the things we talked about um, during part one is that if we keep tri tribal sovereignty in mind, it really helps us understand the basis um, and the reasoning behind these statutory requirements. One of the things that, if you recall, we talked about was that we can't really change the outcomes um, without having a respect for tribal sovereignty. And so, um, again, 
in part two, we're hoping this could be um, a safe space that um, we have some really open discussions during our breakout sessions to um, improve outcomes. And I think that if we if we change the way we think about the law with a recognition of tribal sovereignty and recognizing that tribes do have inherent sovereign authority um, to make decisions for their children, it, it really changes the way that we approach these cases. Um, one of the things that Brooke and I, when we just recently attended a training in Arizona and then have been talking a lot about our practice as we um, continue to try to improve. And one of the areas that really came up um, for us was compassion in our work. And there um, have been a number of articles and we're going to make sure that that article, this main article that we will reference a few different times um, from the University of Michigan Law School um, is available in the chat for you all. But this article just really, I think, um, ties together how important uh, compassion is in all of our work. And it really, it compares um, work in the medical field with our work. Um, similarly, physicians ask patients to engage in treatment plans, just like you all do for, your, uh, for the clients in these cases. And um, and so we really wanted to make sure that as we go through that we highlight how important that is. I so appreciate all of you and Brooke and I so appreciate all of the roles that we all have in this in these cases. And if we weren't compassionate people, we certainly would not be in this work. And so um, for us, I think one of the, um, oops, sorry. One of the quotes that was really that really stuck out to us was that while empathy requires recognizing the emotions of another, being compassionate means feeling motivated to act to alleviate suffering. And in child welfare, I don't think a better example um, out there of trying to alleviate family suffering. So uh, when we demonstrate compassion, compassion in our work, we benefit the children, parents, and stakeholders throughout the case. Compassion leads to best outcomes for families and compassionate casework is best practices. The other thing today, we're going to hear from a tribal panel. Um, tomorrow, we will hear from parents who have been involved in our cases. And I think throughout today and tomorrow, you will hear how important engaging in compassion is in your casework. So this, uh, many of you have probably seen um, this slide before. I um, asked Casey Family Programs and Sheldon Spotted Out for permission to use this in our presentation because I think it just so well demonstrates um, what we're talking about um, in this work. We're talking about keeping children connected. And for some reason, there should be a a body, a, a child's body, um, like a stick man in where right families there. is. But um, the you'll also hear from um, Chief Judge Four Star tomorrow. She's going to be talking about the Brackeen case. And um, there were several amicus briefs that you can all take a look at. And I'd really encourage you to do that. Um, Casey Family Programs uh, did submit an amicus brief. And they talked about basically what you're seeing on the slide here is that, you know, the, the principle of ICWA being the gold standard um, is it really encompasses all relationships, right? That surround a child from birth, including parents and siblings to extended family. And then as the way they put it in the amicus brief, radiating out to the child's broader uh, community and culture. And when we think about child welfare and keeping children connected to families, relatives, and community, that's not um, necessarily a uh, unique to ICWA. Um, the Fostering Connections Act of 2008 also requires that um, the department contact relatives um, within 30 days of removal. And um, our Title 41 policy 
talks about the importance of keeping children with um, family when they cannot be with parents. And so I think Casey does a nice job of just um, talking about that gold standard in terms of community relatives and family. A really powerful part of that amicus brief that again, I really encourage you all to read. Um, you know, they talk about a child who has been removed from her biological family can suffer deep rifts in her sense of identity and connection to a shared history. And so it really helps us kind of understand these circles. Oh, look, there it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, on this same article, one of the things that I really, that Brooke and I really felt like we needed to highlight is that not only does compassion help the other people in our cases, but particularly since we're doing training for all of you who are stakeholders in these cases, that when you exercise compassion um, and it reduces stress, that there's a correlation between empathy and compassion and facing stress without becoming as burnt out. And I, I really do think that after a dozen years of practicing this kind of work, that the more I can find my internal compassion and um, really connect with other people in our cases, whether that's other attorneys or with the parents in the cases, um, that I, I do think that that has allowed all of us who've been in this for so long to really keep going because it decreases that burnout that we often can still face. So, so one of the first topics we're going to talk about is placement preferences. Um, again, this uh, is a quote from an amicus brief um, in this Helen or Brackeen case, and it's actually from former foster children in support of the, the tribal defendants. Um, and they actually quote the Montana Supreme Court. But again, bringing this back around to tribal sovereignty, when we're thinking about placement preferences, we really can't understand the importance of that without understanding what that means to, um, to tribes and their future generations. And so um, I thought this was a really powerful quote. Um, Preservation of Indian culture is undoubtedly threatened and thereby thwarted as a size of any tribal community dwindles. In addition to its artifacts, language, and history, the members of a tribe are its culture. Absent the next generation, any culture is lost and necessarily relegated at best to anthropological examination and categorization. So what a powerful quote from the Montana Supreme Court um, in 1981 that really puts the placement preferences into perspective. So uh, one of the heightened protections of ICWA is that it does provide that when Indian children are removed and cannot be placed, um, cannot remain with their parents, that the state agency has to follow these pre uh, placement preferences. And they are in order of importance. The first placement preference is, as I think we are all aware, that a child needs to be placed with a member of his or her um, extended family and that it would be as defined by the tribe. So the extended family is the highest priority of the placement preferences, recognizing the importance of a child's um, connectedness to his or her family. I also wanted to add that extended family doesn't necessarily mean that it's just the Indian or the Native American side of the family, that um, if you have uh, families in which there are also non-Native family members, that still meets that highest placement preference. Uh, what we also know from ICWA is that the Indian child must be placed in the least restrictive setting that most approximates a family taking into consideration um, the sibling attachment. Um, the placement also needs to allow the Indian child's special needs to be met, if there are any, and the placement, if possible, needs to be in reasonable proximity to the Indian child's home. So within whatever the placement is of the Indian child, we also have to be taking those three factors into consideration. Um, if the a state agency is not able to place with parents and has done a diligent search, which we're going to talk about, um, and has 
exhausted um, any possibility of placing with family, the next placement preference is a foster home that's licensed, approved, or specified by the Indian child's tribe. I think what's important to keep in mind with number two is that it may be an Indian home that um, in collaboration with the tribe that they're suggesting, they may not necessarily be licensed, but the tribe is approving that placement and the home can work on licensing going forward. Um, the third placement preference is an Indian foster home licensed or approved by an authorized non-Indian, meaning the state licensing authority. We're going to later get into a little bit more of the nuances about each of these placement preferences when we talk about some tips, practice tips. Um, the fourth pre uh, placement preference is an institution. These are always our really sad cases, of course, when kiddos have to be in group home settings or residential care. And then of course, you know, we're not, we're obviously focused on the involuntary child custody proceeding prior to adoption during this moving the dial series. Um, but just so that folks know, the adoption placement preferences are a little bit different. Um, the first placement preference is the same in that um, it's a member of the child's extended family, but the second and third are other members of the child's tribe and then any other Indian family. So that might be a, um, a different tribe than the child's tribe. Um, during our over the past few years, we started our ICWA court in 2017. And um, one of the uh, things that we've been trying to improve our practice on has been data collection. And so we wanted to show our the data that we had collected from 2019 um, that uh, shows our percentage of place preferred placements at the time of the show cause, so the initial hearing, and then you'll see on the next slide at the final hearing. Um, and at the time of the show cause hearing um, in our ICWA court, then there were 52% of the kids who were placed in preferred placements. So any of those four that Brooke just mentioned, and probably that's most primarily family. Um, as you see, about 48% then were not placed in preferred placements at the time of the first hearing. Then in 2019, um, this would mean that this, the case ended so that we would be able to see this of their final placement. Um, but what was really exciting to us is that 89% of the placements were preferred placements at the time of the final order. So that would also include return to their parents, um, but would be any other final dispositions as well, whether that was guardianship or um, I guess potentially a termination of parental rights. I can't remember what our stats were for 2019 on a termination, but um, only 11% of the kids then were in non-preferred placements at the final order. Um, one of the things that I have a goal of for, <laughs> Brooke and I have a goal of for our court would be that that would be 100% of preferred placements. Um, we, I, I know that there are times where we have to have the good cause, which we'll talk about in a bit, but I, I think this also demonstrates as we move um, into diligent search that even if initially children aren't placed in a preferred placement, that as you continue to work your cases, um, and the, as these cases continue to progress, those placements can and should change to preferred placements. So Heather, we have a question in the chat of what does ICWA look like for non-Indian fictive kin? So for non-Indian fictive kin, you would be asking for a good cause to depart. Um, okay, so that's not considered a preferred placement? Okay. No. Nope, um, ICWA has a definition of extended family. Um, in 1903, you can take a look at that. Um, but it doesn't include fictive kin. I think the, the nuanced part of that would be if you're working with the tribe and um, the tribe's definition of family would include that, then I think there is an argument that that would be a preferred placement. But in general, we ask for good cause to depart on those. 
And one of those reasons for the good cause may be that the parent has requested that. So we'll get to those as well, but great question. Um, so we wanted to make sure to continue to provide practice tips. So um, for the placement preferences, one of the practice tips for attorneys would be, of course, to consult the tribe on what the placement preferences are. Um, in Montana, the tribes, as far as we are still aware, um, the tribe's placement preferences are all aligned with the placement preferences as stated in the ICWA. If you're working with an out-of-state tribe, what we would really advise all the attorneys, whether it's the county attorney, of course, who or the AAG, who has the burden of um, you know, making sure placement preferences are being followed. But defense attorneys or guardians ad litem can also consult with the um, with the tribe to make sure that placement preferences are being met. Um, we have, we also recommend that um, when you're staffing with your, uh, as the attorney, when you're staffing with the social workers, as you're updating on the cases, that staffing the actual placement preferences is just as important as staffing the facts of the removal. So I think having an understanding from the department um, as the county attorney, it's just as important for me to understand what the department has planned for placement with the children um, and what they have done in order to meet the placement preferences. And then the other thing is at all pre-hearing conferences, we really, I, I know that that's one of the main topics, of course, is placement preference or, or potential placements. And we always bring those up at pre-hearing conferences, but we just wanted to remind all of you that that is a great opportunity for talking about um, potential family. And um, I think sometimes for parents, you know, the time of removal is so traumatic that maybe they haven't thought of someone, maybe they're being incarcerated at that time. And so at the pre-hearing conference, when they have their attorney present, um, I think sometimes it leads to broader discussion about potential family members. Um, and then at each hearing, we really our practice tip would be that the tribe and the child's attorney or guardian ad litem address the position on placement. Um, I think that it's a great opportunity for tribes to state whether or not they are reserving their objections to um, a non-preferred placement or whether they're supportive of that. Um, and then I think for the guardians ad litem and the child's attorney, it really is a great um, time to remind the court if children are not in a preferred placement, what the children have um, relayed to you and uh, what their preferences might be for placement. And then um, the other thing that we wanted to make sure to address is that if a, a name of a family member comes up between either family engagement meeting in court or you know between times that we're all getting together to make sure to communicate that information um, directly to the social worker, also to the county attorney or AAG so to get the individual placed with, um, to get the child placed in a preferred placement. Um, um, and then for social workers, we wanted to remind everyone that um, placement in a home with a sibling, another Indian child, or an Indian child who's previously been adopted in a non-preferred placement does not mean that then the child is in a preferred placement. So if it, this happens a lot um, when a new baby is born in our caseloads and then they're placed with their sibling, which is great, um, but that doesn't mean that then for the baby that becomes a preferred placement because their older sibling is there. So unless that older sibling is the adult that the child's placed with, that does not make a placement a preferred placement. And then um, of course, to, for the social workers to always remember to ask the tribe's position to try to seek consensus on that placement. Um, and for, um, for attorneys and social workers to include what the tribe's position is on placement, um, in affidavits and on the record and court proceedings. And then um, we also, um, for social workers, wanted to mention how important it is to be talking early and often to family members about licensing. I think that that can be one of the things for 
family members that can be a barrier for either a final disposition of a guardianship or something like that, but also can be a barrier if people are financially struggling with raising additional children without some assistance um, from the from the foster care payments. And so one of the things that I am always impressed with is um, when our workers connect our family, our um, tribal families with their state, or I'm sorry, with their ICWA agent or licensing workers for the tribe. Um, sometimes that can be really helpful to have um, family members get connected with the tribal social workers to assist in filling out packets and doing the things that they need to do in order to become licensed. Um, I also think that um, this is really a time for social workers um, to be able to demonstrate their compassion and empathy for the family members who are being asked to take on such a burden um, and be able to say, you know, we know this is really hard that your daughter had her children removed. Is there something that we can do to make this placement easier um, or to facilitate some assistance to you? Um, so that I think is a great opportunity. And then for the judges, um, this is a real opportunity to demonstrate compassion to the litigant or to the parents who are in front of you. Um, I think for judges to just be able to say at the, even starting at that initial emergency protective services hearing all the way through of saying, this is so hard that your children are out of your care. I am like, thank you for being here. Thank you for being at this hearing. And if the children cannot go home to you today, are you okay with where they are placed? Is there somebody else that is a support? Is there someone else that you would want to see your children placed with? I think when judges ask that, um, it's pretty uh, impactful to see what a parent's response is when a judge really inquires as to what the parent's wishes are. And all of us would want that. If my kids couldn't be with me, then I would you know, want people to ask me what my wishes are, so. So we know that um, the agency's obligation is to ensure um, children are placed within those preferences unless we're demonstrating good cause, which we'll talk about later. And so, so what does that mean when the priority is extended family? What is the department, um, what is the department's obligation? Uh, well, it's called the diligence search and it provided for in the ICWA regulations. And in every proceeding, the department must document that it's diligently searched for family or other placements meeting the placement preferences of the ICWA. I think a really important aspect of this that um, can sometimes get missed because we're all so busy and sometimes our court dockets are, are pretty um, large and we all have lots of petitions and affidavits that we're writing is to continuously document that diligent search. So that diligent search needs to be um, documented in the first affidavit. Uh, when we get to court, we need to be updating that if there have been any efforts between the removal and the first time we're appearing in court. And then we need to talk about it at every single hearing. So when, um, I think this was in 2019, our ICWA court team presented at NICWA, and I think we referenced this during part one, but one of the documents that our team came up with, with the help of um, Jen Weber and Heather Eliezer, supervisors in our ICWA court, was just to come up with a non-exhaustive list um, as a, a tool for social workers when they're documenting their diligent search. I mean, certainly there are going to be other efforts that um, the agency uh, may do to look for those family members and other preferred placements, but this was just um, a tool that we came up with. One of the, can you move that down a little, Heather? I apologize, I can't see that number. That's okay. Um, one of the really important parts of the diligent search is to be collaborating with the tribe um, something that we're going to be posting on the CIP website is a chart that will indicate for each tribe in Montana 
who is the person or persons and what is their contact information for the agency to reach out to and ask for what is called sometimes a kinship report or a family report. And what we know from our tribal partners is that uh, most often these family or kinship reports are going to include uh, members of a child's family that are not listed in a Seneca search, for example. So again, this really comes back to that importance about um, tribal uh, and state collaboration. Um, one of the other important um, things that can happen is when the department sends that verification uh, for re uh, the request for verification of the child's membership status, um, right there, the agency can be asking for that kinship report. Um, another important thing is for, um, as Heather was saying, to be obviously asking the parents and to have them fill out a genogram. And oftentimes, um, this brings up family members that, you know, like Heather was saying, maybe they didn't think about at that, at that first hearing. Um, this is just the second part of that chart that we came um, up with with the help of CPS and uh, supervisors. And we can make that available on the CIP website as well. I'm just going to check the chat if there are some questions. Um, so we, um, I think... Mick was asking about the placement preferences for the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribe. We actually, and I appreciate you bringing that up, Mick, we um, reached out to Yolanda Page, who is the attorney for the tribes, and she um, confirmed that the tribe's preferences are consistent with the placement preferences. So, but I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, Another thing that we wanted to talk about with respect to some practice tips is the Seneca searches. Because we hear a lot about these, but um, so I think it's important that we are talking more clearly and thoroughly. It really goes to the diligence when we're telling the court, we're not, we weren't able to place this kiddo with family. One of our efforts was that we did a Seneca search. But what does that mean? And so really important to be getting on the record who was on the Seneca search, who's the child's family. And again, this is not just a requirement of the Indian Child Welfare Act. It's also a federal requirement under the Fostering Connections Act of 2008. Um, so we need to be documenting who are the child's family. Um, what did the worker do to obtain the contact information? So sometimes my understanding is the Seneca searches will not include contact information, but we know that the um, ICWA agent might have contact information, or maybe the ICWA agent will refer us to enrollment who's able to help with some contact information. So we need to be diligent about finding ways to reach out to these family members. And what, what did you do to contact them? Um, did you send certified letters? Um, did you try calling? Who on that Seneca search did you contact? When did you contact them? Um, and what was their response? I think this last bullet point is really important to be documenting in court because just saying we've done a Seneca search um, doesn't really tell us um, what the next steps were, right? And so if we talk to grandma and grandma says, um, I'm not able to be a placement, the next question is, well, are there any other family members that I'm not aware of that I should be reaching out to? So the other thing I think for, um, or a few other things, uh, social workers have a lot of tasks on these diligent searches, um, but it, this is another opportunity for compassion uh, of, a question like, who are the people who could potentially support you in getting your children home? So maybe that's not people who end up being able to be placement. But I think in asking it that way of who are supports to you, who are people who you rely on, um, that can really help. And as Brooke just mentioned, maybe grandma says she cannot, but grandma might have a neighbor who is more able-bodied or is able to 
offer that kind of support um, to the parents. Um, and then one of the things that I think can happen sometimes because social workers are getting so much information, especially at the beginnings of the cases, you know, you're finding out the facts of the removal, getting to know the parents, trying to understand what the children's needs are, that sometimes I've heard, um, you know, a worker say, oh, well, have your mom call me. And really, it it is on the department to make those efforts to contact the family members. And so we shouldn't be waiting as the department to contact, to have family contact us, but we should be really reaching out to the family members whose names we names and contact we receive. Um, another tip would be to send ICPCs early in the case. Um, I think that that's one of the things that, of course, we all, the goal is to get kids back with their parents. And so sometimes I think that ICPCs can seem counterintuitive because if a child's going to be placed out of state, of course, reunification becomes really difficult. Knowing that we have a family member available, um, especially you know if we can make those contacts and start them down the path of being in touch with their state agents, their um, the state in which they reside, so that we can make those ICPCs um, a little bit more efficient and hopefully get done a little earlier. Um, and then the um, I know we just mentioned that but that family and kinship report to ask the ICWA agent how you receive that, if it's from enrollment or from them directly. And then if, um, if for some reason, you know, an ICWA agent's out of the office and you're not sure what to do, you can always contact Carrera, who's the ICWA program specialist for the state, um, and be in touch with her about best practices or best ways to reach um, individuals for that information. Um, and then for county attorneys, uh, we really want to make sure to remind you that that information needs to be part of the record, that the diligent search is something that we, we have to make sure is in affidavits and or in testimony and or just stated by you, um, court directly, um, and to be updating the court between when an affidavit is drafted, even if there's new information that comes in the next month, um, you know, between the filing of a, say, a petition for extension and then to the hearing you have. And then for defense counsel, even though, of course, it's incumbent on the department to be the one locating family, a lot of times I think as parents counsel, you um, you know are able to make a level, build a level of trust with your client that can sometimes be more difficult with CPS. And so if you're interviewing the clients um, and names come up, please share those. And then if you want to attempt to contact family, we really encourage that. Again, sometimes family members might be more trusting of the attorney for the parent um, to get that information. And then for judges at every hearing to ask the department, if children are not in a preferred placement, what has the department done since the last hearing to find one? Um, I think those follow-up questions are really important. And then the other thing that that does is when parents are present in the courtroom and the judge asks that, asks that question of the department, it can really show how much the judge cares that the children end up in a preferred placement and how important that is to have them be with um, a preferred placement for as long as they possibly can be during the duration of the case. All right, so now we are talking about good cause to depart from placement preferences. So when the department has done its due diligence and is unable to find one of those four placement preferences, then um, the child is in a non-Indian state licensed foster home. What we need to do is document what the good cause is. What is the reason that that child is not in a preferred placement? And we need to be asking the court to make a finding that there is good cause to depart from those placement preferences. And so again, that really needs to be set forth in the worker's affidavit really thoroughly. The judge has to make that finding by clear and convincing evidence. And it's on the agency, it's on the, the state has the burden to prove that there is good car, excuse me, good cause to depart from the placement preferences.
So there, the regulations are um, where you need to go for the good cause uh, language. So the statute itself does not include a discussion of good cause to depart, but the regulations um, guide us. And so there are certain things that the court cannot consider. So one of them is the socioeconomic status of any placement relative to another placement. Um, I think that we've all been in situations where um, conversations can start talking about what the homes look like relative to one another, um, what activities the children are exposed to in say a family placement versus a, um, a non-family placement. And um, those are things that really the court cannot be considering. Um, the regulations also indicate that the court cannot consider ordinary bonding or attachment that flowed from time spent in a non-preferred placement that was made in violation of ICWA. That's a lot of, a lot of words. <laughs> and essentially what that means is if the state didn't do its job in the beginning, and didn't provide and didn't follow all those statutory obligations that we talked about in part one in June. So notice in particular, uh, if we miss the notice, that legal notice piece, and we place the child in a non-preferred placement, um, the court cannot later consider the fact that, oh, well, this child has now been there for nine months and is bonded. I think uh, apart from this, we need to be really careful, um, even when the state has followed all of its statutory obligations to use ordinary bonding or attachment as a reason for good cause. One of the resources that I would really encourage um, attorneys and judges and even social workers um, to take a look at is the 2016 guidelines for implementing the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, I know as when I talk to workers, they talk about their field guide, um, you know, the SAMS model and all of those things that they follow as their Bible. This truly is kind of what I think of as my Bible. It's a wonderful um, explanation of um, that goes into further detail um, about the regulations and specifically on ordinary bonding or attachment. One of the things the guideline says is that as a best practice, state agencies and courts should carefully consider whether the fact that an Indian child has developed a relationship with a non-preferred placement outweighs the long-term benefits to a child that can arise from maintaining connections to family and tribal community. And so that really goes back to the gold standard that we're talking about and understanding the importance of an Indian child's connectedness to family tribe and culture. So I would just um, caution everyone about that. And I just wanted to, I think that this comes up a ton in our cases. This is something that I think can be real, um, real heartbreakers at periods of time when children have been in a non-preferred placement for a year or even two and then family members either out of state or family members become available or um, or it's time to move the children into a not to, into a preferred placement i i just i want to say that i i remember a case that Brooke and i had years and years ago where i was a guardian ad litem and Brooke was a parent's attorney and it was so heartbreaking for me as the guardian ad litem to think about this little girl moving from her foster home she had been with to her grandmother. And ultimately now knowing what I know about how children can reform attachments and bonds once they have learned how to bond and attach, and also thinking about that child's long-term best interest in being placed with her family, I know that that was the right thing. And so I, I just, I really want to say that it's not that Brooke and I think that this isn't a really tough decision sometimes when children have to be moved. But long term, those foster families then have set that child up for success because they have allowed a safe and um, stable attachment to have been formed. So I think to say that. the other thing about that, it, it is interesting, you know, we we talk a lot about the mindset and keeping tribal sovereignty kind of as 
as the overarching understanding of ICWA. I think that's important when we talk about this only family argument. And so a lot of times we'll hear, well, this is the only family the child has ever known. What I think is important to that we're also asking ourselves as stakeholders is what about the only family the child was born into? What about the only family that the child may not be connected to long-term? So, okay, what is, yes, what is good cause? Okay, so we can consider um, a number of things when we want to request the court to make that good cause finding. So one of the thing, one of the options um, is that the, the parent, the Indian child's parents have requested that um, we depart from the placement preferences. And I think that goes back to that earlier question from Kelly. What about, you know, a non or a fictive kin in an ICWA case? Well, this could absolutely be an example where a, a, in, an Indian child's parents might say, our next door neighbor is absolutely who I want my child placed with. And um, I understand that my mother is available, but she is on the reservation. And then that um, transportation back and forth in order to um, have parenting time will be frustrated. It will be difficult. And so the, the parent can say, I, I would like this child placed in this non-preferred placement um, for whatever reasons. So um, with the, during that period of time, then, you know, if a parent has made that request, it does promote some additional parenting time. Um, and what we would advise is that the best practice during that period of time would be to promote connections with the extended family um, so that if grandma who lives on the reservation, you're not going to initially place because the parent has requested a closer placement is to make sure that the child is having the opportunity for contact and um, ongoing connection with those family members. And then that way, if we need to transition a child from the non-preferred placement to a preferred placement later in the case, that that transition is easier. Um, and also this is another great opportunity to continue to ask the parents, what do you believe is best for your child? Where do you think would be the best idea and placement option? Um, the, uh, another option is the request of an Indian child if the child is of sufficient age. And we have definitely seen that in our cases where we have a child who, um, an example of a case of mine is a daycare provider that that child was really familiar with and felt really safe and comfortable with. That daycare provider um, allowed a lot of opportunities for parent contact. And so a child had been really clear that they had wanted to remain in that non-preferred placement. Um, this um, third option of the presence of a sibling attachment that can be maintained only through a particular placement. Um, I want to caution all of us on that because I think as I gave that example earlier today of um, when a new baby is born. And so I think continuing to make sure that we are trying to see if we could maintain a sibling attachment in a different way. Of course, we recognize how important it is for children to be placed together if they can be. But if, if there is an option for, say, um, a different family member that wasn't available at the first child's placement, or if they have a, a different side of the family, um, you know, if it, if the child has a different mother or father than the sibling, um, that we can actually maintain sibling connections in ways in which the children are not placed together. And I think some creativity in that is always helpful. Um, and where siblings cannot be placed together, the rule does require them to be placed in close proximity, if at all possible. Um, that is really important. I think that um, a lot of times we'll hear that from our tribal partners, how important that sibling connection is. And so it is no surprise to me that the um, regulations would also say siblings need to be close to one another. Um, okay. The uh, Another option for a good cause to depart finding is the extraordinary physical, mental, or emotional needs of the Indian child. Um, I definitely ask for a good cause to depart in instances in which 
for example, babies are in the NICU um, because they have extraordinary um, physical needs at that point. Um, we also do see, of course, children who have who are unable to be maintained in their family or non-preferred placement because of their mental or emotional needs, where they unfortunately have to go to congregate care of some sort. Um, and so that can be a good cause to depart. I have also seen us need to ask for that when a therapeutic foster home is av available for a child. Um, and so that is certainly one good one um, finding that the court can make that there is good cause. The last one, uh, oh yeah, please. One thing that I wanna say about the, the special needs, um, we talked about this being a, a safe space and um, part of cultural humility is really checking ourselves right on our own biases. And I think um, this can come up because we're all human. Um, and we need to be careful when a child is initially not placed in a preferred placement um, and has special needs, but then later on family does become available. I think there can be at times a tendency for then us to um, assume that that non-Indian placement is meeting the child's needs. And so that's the best place for that child. When I think what is really incumbent under ICWA is that we're working with extended family who have identified themselves as being willing to be a placement and supporting them as to how they can meet the child's needs. So I think we really need to be careful about making assumptions of who can best meet the child's needs when uh, a child has already been in a home for a period of time. Um, let's see here. Great question. In times of conflicting. Okay. The, so does tribal preference still outweigh parents of Indian child or Indian child's preference in times of conflicting wishes, who determines best option and which is most appropriate? Um, I, I think that all of those, um, the tribe's wishes need to be taken into consideration, the Indian child's and the Indian child's um, parents' wishes need to be taken into consider. The regulations specifically talk about the parents' wishes needing to be taken into consideration. Um, I think this really comes back to that collaboration between the state and tribe. I think this, and, and defense counsel also, right? And the parent and the child, the guardian ad litem. Um, if, if I had a case where that, you know, that came up, I would probably want everyone to sit down together and, and discuss that. Um, because I think everyone's perspective is really important. Um, but ultimately, of course, the judge is going to be the person who makes that decision if there's a conflict. And I have had one of those hearings where one of the parents um, wanted to maintain a non-preferred placement. Um, one was absent and then the tribe, um, there was a family member. And so we had a long hearing on that and long-term best interests of the child. And ultimately, um, the decision to place with family was what Judge Souza made um, based on the entirety of the circumstances um, and probably the circumstances of the parent who was vocal being long-term incarcerated, I think probably weighed pretty heavily on Judge Souza um, as, a, as a fact for him. Um, and yes, does it mean, do special needs mean extraordinary needs? It can. I'm, um, there isn't a definition of what extraordinary needs are, um, but the guidelines probably have some guidance for us on that. And I will, I'll take a look at that and put that in the chat. So, the um, the final one of a good cause to depart is the unavailability of a suitable placement after a determination by the court 
that a diligent search was conducted to find suitable placements meeting the criteria, but none has been located. So um, for purposes of that analysis, uh, the standards for determining whether a placement is unavailable must conform to the prevailing social and cultural standards of the Indian community in which the Indian child's parent or extended family resides or with which they have social and cultural ties. So that is really important that the department is documenting the diligent search. So if we're asking for good cause to depart because there has not been a suitable placement found during that period of time, um, for the court to make that finding at the subsequent hearings, um, we need to make sure that's an ongoing diligent search that we're documenting and being clear about. I also think that this, um, I just really want to remind all of us that most of us have people who love us and care about us. And so while we might not find a suitable placement, again, this is an opportunity, I think, for all of us to try to connect the children with their people and connect parents with their people. And so even if for whatever reason, a family member cannot be placement, they still might have the opportunity to offer support, whether that's supervising some parenting time or helping with transportation. The other thing I think to understand about a lot of tribal cultures is that it can really be, it's, it can be very inappropriate to fight over children depending on people, on the tribe with which you're, the children are affiliated. Um, so sometimes when families don't come forward until the end, that is a culturally appropriate response to the children being out of the parents' care because family members are not going to fight over children. Um, I think that sometimes it can seem as if people are are waiting until the last minute, but really it's it's an understanding of what um, what a tribe what tribes peoples may decide that they should be um, is most appropriate for their family and their family structures. So if there is this finding, I do think it's important um, that at each hearing you're addressing that you know, then this was the next effort we made. And as we mentioned with the previous um, slides about the um, practice tip for the judges, so. So the question about extraordinary needs, Heather, um, can be found in the guidelines at H4. And if it's actually page 62, it doesn't provide too much guidance, but it, it simply says the rule retains discretion for courts and agencies to consider any extraordinary physical, mental, or emotional needs of a particular Indian child. So I suppose that's in the eye of the beholder. Okay, so we wanted to talk about some practice tips for good cause to depart. Um, overall, I think it's important for all of us as stakeholders to just remember that Congress intended good cause to be used only in extraordinary circumstances. So I think that's just um, out the gate, something that we all need to keep in mind. Um, also important as a team that we're making a finding as to the placement at every hearing. Of course, this is um, our role as county attorneys and AAGs. Um, if the court isn't doing this, we're reminding them but certainly the GAL um, and the tribe or the child's attorney can also help make sure that we are addressing that. Um, and for judges, it's important to remember that that list that we just went through is um, not an exhaustive list. And at the end of the day, the court does retain discretion as to whether um, there is good cause uh, to depart from those placement preferences. Okay, so now we are going to talk about active efforts. So active efforts under ICWA is set forth in 1912D, and what it says is that any party seeking to effect a foster care placement or termination of parental rights has to prove that remedial services and rehabilitative programs designed to prevent the breakup of the Indian family uh, were provided to the family and that they were unsuccessful. 
Okay, and so the ICWA itself does not define active efforts. However, the regulations do. And the regulations talk about active efforts being affirmative, active, thorough, and timely. I, one of the important parts of the regulations definition is that um, active efforts should be conducted in partnership with the Indian child, parents, extended family members, and tribe. So I think that's an important thing for um, the agency to remember is that we really are um, addressing the family as a whole, and we are addressing the family from the from the Indian family's perspective. And so that may or may not include extended family, but we should be collaborating with the tribe. So it's all of these things. It's not just the services that we're providing for the parents. It's really a holistic approach. So the Montana Supreme Court has also weighed in on what active efforts means. Um, there's a case citation to a 2019 case that um, cites several other cases, um, but the Montana Supreme Court clearly has uh, referred to active efforts as um, being not passive, right? And that we cannot simply wait for a parent to complete a treatment plan, that there has to be, that the department needs to be proactive. Um, in the parent panel, um, tomorrow, you're going to hear from a gentleman who might be talking about um, some experiences of just, you know, providing, you know, I was provided a treatment plan and, and was told I had six months to do that compared to another experience that he had where there was a, a much more proactive approach. So I'm excited for you to hear about that. Um, the Montana Supreme Court has said when a parent fails to engage satisfactorily with a department, the department still must try to engage the parent. So similar to what Heather was talking about in terms of um, the diligent search, that we can't wait for the family to come to us. Similarly, the department um, needs to make those efforts, um, even when it may seem that the parent is not engaged. Um, so for some examples of the active efforts, um, we, uh, these are listed, we failed to add the citation, but <laughs> we'll add that before we put it up on, um, on the website. But this, these examples, I think are so helpful to see kind of what, what Congress, what the intention was between, um, for active efforts. So the conducting a comprehensive assessment of the circumstances of the Indian child's family. So it's it's not just a cursory view, it really is a comprehensive assessment of them, of the family. Um, and then as actively assisting parents in obtaining the services that have been identified. Um, and then I think each of these offer some pretty clear examples of, um, of how we can engage in active efforts in all of these different um, kind of uh, options. So the example of offering and employing all available and culturally appropriate family preservation strategies and facilitating the use of remedial and rehabilitative services provided by the child's tribe. That gives such a great um, opportunity to the department and to engage the child's tribe in coming up with ways in which to reunify a particular family. Um, I think there have been many staffings that we've been at where when we have talked with the child's tribe um, ICWA agent that we've been able to find out ways that might better serve a particular family um, in getting a parent engaged and getting their children back into their care. Um, the, uh, importantly about active efforts, um, that we must document these. Um, so it's not just that workers then part, then engage in active efforts, but it is also that those are documented. 
Um, and they have to be implemented from the outset of the case. So um, from the get-go in order to prevent removal and then um, efforts maintained until the dismissal of the case, um, the uh, that the NRA KL and then also the 2016 regulations um, do recommend that the courts monitor and um, inquire at every proceeding about the compliance with the active efforts requirement. Um, and then really making sure that the court's making that finding at, at every hearing. The 2016 guidelines make four recommendations for what state agencies should include in their documentation. One is that the issues the family is facing, um, that the state agency is targeting those with active efforts. Two, a list of the active efforts the state agency determines would best address the issues and reasoning for choosing those specific efforts. So I think um, not just that we have gotten them um, engaged with chemical dependency treatment, but why we have chosen Billings Urban Indian um, as a treatment provider. Three, dates, persons contacted, and other details evidencing how the state agency provided active efforts. And then four, results of the active efforts provided and where the results were less than satisfactory whether the state agency adjusted those efforts to better address the issues. And I think this is another example of an opportunity for compassion. If for some reason um, we aren't being successful when it comes to treatment or parenting time, how has the state then attempted to adjust its requirements in order to meet the parents' needs or address the barriers? One of the examples you will see in that compassion article, if you read that, is the example of a woman who um, had done really well until she needed to be able to take um, a bus to her treatment providers. She had a physical limitation that didn't allow her to walk to the bus stop. And so there was a, um, an instance in which a, the entirety of the team jumped to conclusions about why that woman was not attending treatment any longer when really it had to do with a physical limitation, not her um, desire to get her children back in her care. And so I think that um, that is an important aspect of active efforts is to document what you are doing to try to overcome the barriers that parents and you are able to identify um, as reasons for a lack of in, um, forward movement. So also in this compassion article, which we're really hoping all of you will, it's a very easy read. It probably takes about 10 minutes and it's well worth your time. This was one of um, the quotes that really um, stood out to Heather and I um, separately. And then when we came together, we realized we both had this highlighted, but it talks about um, the mindset of providing active efforts and that when the focus is on concrete services provided to a family that it really misses an important element and that important element is compassion and the article uh, emphasizes that um, that when parents are interviewed that they consistently talk about that it was more important for their worker to focus on their needs um, and the the agency's willingness to help them overcome those obstacles versus just the concrete services. Um, and like Heather was saying in the beginning, um, the medical research shows better outcomes for patients when providers um, are including the patient in the place in their case planning and giving them a voice. So there was a direct correlation between when a provider was saying, what do you, what do you think about this treatment plan? Um, getting their buy-in, there was a correlation between that and adherence to treatment. And so that makes a lot of sense when we try to make that correlation to child welfare because outcomes of child welfare um, depend on the parent's ability, right? To work with professionals and adhere to a treatment plan, just like um, health outcomes depend on the same. So we are at our time. 
um, for the tribal panel to get going. And um, they are scheduled to start at 945. Brooke and I don't have a lot of slides left on active efforts, but I think then we'll finish, finish tomorrow. Okay, we'll finish those up tomorrow um, when we then talk about the qualified expert witness and the um, uh, final dispositions in cases. So I think I, Kelly, if this is okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I believe that's what I should do. Um, and... Does that seem about right to everybody? Okay, great. Good job, ladies. Thanks, Edie. Um, okay, so Kelly, I have Edie here, so I'm going to adjust my computer so she can be part of the panel and Carrera, and then we'll let you both get started. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that sounds great. Kevin, if you would highlight or spotlight our speakers, our panelists, and then Carrera will take um, take over. They'll need and, to turn their videos on so I can do that. Ah. Okay. I've been, yeah. So if uh, Rebecca, Buffalo, Sarah Crawford, Mary DeBerry, Crystal Blumel, Edie Adams, Kathy Kapos and so Kevin Edie will be from okay. and not a problem. I'll do Great. that right now. So that's Kevin me. and Crescentia um so also needs to put her video on. Yeah, so the ones that I uh, just kind of called out, I'll need their videos on. Mm -hmm. We have audio from those folks, at least. Spotlight, okay. Okay, there we go. Yay! Yay! <laughs> two, and then there were two. Spotlight. Slowly but surely, Sorry. we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there slowly but surely. <laughs> Mary, I don't see Mary to Mary. Yeah, she's not signed on. So maybe move on to the next person. Okay, yeah, Kathy. Kathy. Kathy, you'll need to turn your video on if you can hear me. Sarah, let's go down to Sarah Crawford. And then back up to. And then Carrera. Which one? Carrera. What about Rebecca Buffalo? That's it. Uh, so Rebecca, I did not, uh, let's see here. She was on. She, I just asked her to turn hers on. Let's see her. Rebecca, Buffalo, there she is, okay. That's spotlight. And who am I missing? Carrera. Kathy Carrera, which one is Carrera? Did you find Kathy calf boss ribs? I'm her sorry. Her video is not on. Oh, okay. Julie, her video is still off. I'm still looking for, so who do I need to add? One more. Carrera well, Pretty Paint. Okay, she's not in my list. That's why I'm not seeing her. Sorry. Oh, oops. I was just going by my list. She was yeah, on. She's She's our moderator. So. Yeah, that's easy enough. Mm -hmm. I just got to find her in there. There she is. Okay. All right. 
I think that's it. I'll keep looking for Kathy to see. Yeah, her video just turned on. Oh, Kathy. Did it? Yep. Okay, great. I'll add her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All righty. She I think that's everyone. Like years younger than. <laughs> okay, Carrera, you're on. And they may want to unmute all of them. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to introduce myself. If nobody knows who I am, my name's Carrera Pretty Paint. I'm the ICWA program specialist for child and family services. Um, one of my main duties is to keep to build the relationships with the tribes and try to keep an updated contact list for the tribes in Montana and also outside of Montana. Um, so I just wanted to um, get started by thanking the tribal members that we have here um, on the panel today. So I'm not gonna introduce them one by one. Um, so what I'm gonna do is as I direct a question to the panelists, then they'll introduce themselves, their title, um, which tribe they're from, and then they'll go into um, the response for the question. So, and then if anybody has any questions during the panel discussion, um, please use the chat and Kelly will be monitoring that. And if we have time at the end, we will get to those questions. So we'll get started. Um, I'm gonna start with Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Hi. <laughs> so um, in the passing, ICWA found in 1978 that there is no resource for resource more vital to the continued existence and integrity of Indian tribes than their children. Can you explain what significance that statement has for your tribe historically and today? Okay, I'm Rebecca Buffalo with the Indian Child Welfare with the Crow Tribe. And uh, I'm the coordinator for the ICWA department here. And um, the question that I, um, let's see, I'm kind of, I'm kind of nervous here, but <laughs> in a way, yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Where am I? I wrote it down, so I kind of bear with me here. Yeah, and um, Rebecca, would you like Sarah to answer that first, so you can you can find your notes and then join uh, in? Yes, yes, me because I got I wrote it down everything. So yeah, yeah. okay, Sarah, mm -hmm. would you mind starting? Yeah, sure. Hamataki um, My name is Sarah Crawford. I am a member of the Sister Wapton Oyate, which is a tribe located in northeastern South Dakota. Um, but I live here in Montana. Um, I work, I'm an associate attorney uh, for uh, Clause Law, and uh, Clause Law provides services uh, to a number of tribes throughout uh, Indian country. But particularly because I live here in Montana, um, we provide, I provide in-house counsel for the Little Shell Tribe um, in Great Falls, and that's where I'm at today. And so I've been working for the Little Shell Tribe for, um, I think, of over three, four years now. And um, part of the big job that I've been doing is creating and building up um, their, their child welfare program and focusing on ICWA issues. Um, and as far as the question goes, because this is a really important question, especially for the Little Shell Tribe. I know as many of you know, the Little Shell Tribe um, had fought for fed the restoration of its federal recognition for over 150 years. And because of that, because of that continual fight, um, there was always a fight also to retain um, the tribe's cultural identity and to retain the, the culture and the community. And that was always the biggest thing um, for the tribe. And as you know, they were called the landless Indians. And so 
it was always a big struggle for the tribe as far as maintaining and, and you know, ensuring that their cultural identity wasn't getting lost. And so the, that is why the Indian Child Welfare Act was so important in its passage, because that really provided um, not only the Little Shell tribe, but tribes across Indian country, the ability to retain their cultural identity um, through having the sovereignty to, you know, make sure that the children that are their members, are their citizens, are, are being kept within their community and are being kept within, um, within family connections and extended families and to ensure that um, that that kind of stuff isn't lost because that was the whole point, you know, back in the 70s, 60s was the whole aspect of assimilation and even going back hundreds of years. And so there was always this huge fight as far as for tribes to ensure that that the US government did not win on that point of assimilation. And so for the Little Shell tribe in particular, that the passage was important. And when the tribe gained its um, or had its recognition restored in 2019, that was one of the first programs to really kind of get built up and honed in on and to really focus on, you know, regaining that um, community building and ensuring that the little shell children um, are not just being, you know, placed in non-native homes, in non-little shell homes, and therefore just continuing that perpetuation perpetuation of, of losing their identity. And so that's been a really big goal for the tribe as a whole too, just to ensure that um, cultural programming is being built. And that is one of the key focuses even now, um, if we routinely have a cultural programming here in Great Falls and even on Zoom to ensure that everyone everywhere uh, can can attend and can, um, kind of uh, learn and, and really interact with the tribe and its culture. Thank you for that, Sarah. That was that was great. I really like um, your response. And um, I know the Little Shell Tribe, they just um, kind of got recently fairly recognized in 2019. Um, so, and you do have an office in Great Falls, right? Yeah, okay. so the tribe has its main um, headquarters here in Great Falls. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so next, <laughs> are you ready, Rebecca? <laughs> yes, I found okay. it. So, anyway, yeah, with, with the Crow tribe, you know, um, you know, our clan system is so important within our tribe. And then with the, um, you know, with the social, like the social roles that the parents have in our, within our tribe, you know, it's just, you know, the clan system, like, let's say, you know, when Indian Child Welfare was first established in 1978, and then, um, you know, we, the Crow tribe, like, let's say if a child is removed, and then, you know, the families that um, are working with the system, and then we kind of go to our clan uncles and clan aunts, and, you know, it's so important within our Crow Reservation that, you know, the culture is, um, we run to our clan parents to pray and feed them and give them gifts. I hope we didn't lose her. Okay. okay. Especially when um, a child is going to be adopted out, then we have to kind of um, bring it to our tribal legislators and let them know that, you know, we work really hard with the parents in the state and that the parents, you know, uh, are not there to get these kids back. So we have to kind of let them know because we don't want the tribe to say that, for instance, like for me, I don't want them to say, okay, Rebecca Buffalo gave our kids to non-Indians, you know, adopt them out, you know, so I have to work uh, 
diligence to look for families on a reservation to keep to bring these kids back to the reservation. And you know, way back in um, before 1978, you know, I have parents come into my office and before ICWA was established that they were shipped out back east and they come back and they want their identity, you know, their families, they want to know their families. And so once the ICWA was established, you know, we know where these kids are. And today we work closely with the department and look for families for these kids. And, you know, like, um, we search families for the kids that are in the system. And, you know, we work closely with the department. And, you know, so the Crow tribe is really um, like earlier when um, Heather was saying that, um, that the Crows don't fight over children. And we still keep that, you know, and um, that is, really important within the Crow tribe that, you know, the Crows don't fight over children among, you know, like maybe the, the families. So, you know, we just kind of, they kind of sit back until toward the end of permanency. And, you know, so that is so important in our tribe, our culture is not to fight over Almost 30 years and I see the difference let's see 20 years ago you know parents really um, want their kids back but now um, due to drugs and alcohol you know these poor kids are in the system and the parents don't even care anymore and so I work closely with Yellowstone County social workers and you know county attorneys that I search the grandparents are raising their grandkids. And so, yes, um, you know, there's a lot of difference between, you know, long time ago, but now we know where our children are. You know, they're all in, you know, the whole United States. I got cases like in California, um, Chicago, you know, all over. So I know where the, our children are, you know, I've been monitoring them. So. Thank you, Rebecca. That was um, a great response. I really like that you added, you know, the importance of the clan system and, um, you know, the, the Crow tribe not fighting over children. I know that's um, kind of a big thing and very important in a lot of families. Um, so thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to move on to the, the next question. And um, this question is going to go to Kathy. Um, so ICWA is considered the gold standard because it recognizes and prioritizes the importance of keeping children connected to their families, community and culture. One of the ways ICWA attempts to accomplish this goal is through placement preferences, um, requiring children to be placed with extended family if possible. So can you share the role that extended family and culture plays in your children's lives? Kathy, you're on mute. <laughs> really going. <laughs> um, my name is Kathy Cal Foster Ibs. I'm the ICWA coordinator for Black Creek Tribe in Browning, Montana. Um, let me go back to the question. Okay. So so we do meaning the tribe, we do try to keep our kids placed with family, extended family, because our culture is very important to our tribe. Um, sometimes 
placing children, Blackfeet like children with a family member, the extended family member or just a tribal member. I'm having a lot of trouble doing this because there is not a lot of foster families out there. Um, right now, we just got a new foster licensor. So we're trying to recruit family, um, our foster families. Um, and we're not being very successful at that right now. Um, but we believe that placing our children with family members to preserve our culture is very important. Um, we have different groups here on the reservation. Um, our school system here is trying very hard to preserve our language, our culture. Uh, we have an immersion school here on in Browning that teaches it's teaches like the daily instructions that the public school does. But sorry, but it's all in our Blackfeet language. Um, so our culture is very important here. Um, Um, so oh, go I'm gonna or do I answer question B too? Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna ask you to follow up <laughs> on the question if you didn't mind. Okay. Um so how does a child's exposure to culture and relationship with family affect an Indian person's identity both as a child and uh an adult? So I'll use myself as an example. So I was brought up, I was the only child. Um, my mom and dad, we lived next door to my grandparents, my mom's parents. I was raised um, with knowing my culture. My grandparents spoke Blackfeet. They, they talked English, but their first language was Blackfeet. Um, so I grew up knowing my name, my language, my culture. Um, my family was um, really close. We done everything together. Um, so as an adult, I try and instill that into my children. Um, my youngest talks Blackfeet. She went to the immersion school. Um, she knows her culture. Well, all three of my kids know their culture. They're well mannered. My older two are um, doing well. Uh, one's becoming a police officer. The other is a EMT works with the EMS office here in Browning. Um, they, um, growing up with knowing our culture and um, being in a tight knit family, they have the um, tools basically to fall back on. Um, out in the real world. They know that they can always come back to, to us, our family, and get guidance if they should need it. Um, but that's a lot of things that the children in foster care are lacking now because we don't really have a lot of foster pl placements that instill this in our in our younger children. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you for that, Kathy. Um, a lot of important 
points that you made in there. And um, I just, I kind of liked how you just explained that, like when, you know, like the tribes always here for those children who kind of lose their ties with their um, tribe, like you're always here to help them, to guide them. Um, I think that's very important in this field, um, especially to these children who didn't really grow up in that kind of um, culture piece and in the tradition. So thank you, Kathy. So um, I kind of wanted to go into the um, the idea of like the only family that Brooke had kind of mentioned. And I just wanted to go to Crescentio for this, this question. Um, so could you say more with like the respect of only family or even the attach attachment argument that this is the the only family the child has known for the past two years and they're attached to you know these caregivers this family and why that only family argument is the very reason why ICWA was passed do you kind of you get what I'm asking uh, I think so I I'll, I'll answer to the best of my ability. Um, Good morning, everyone. My name is Crescentia. So I am the ICWA unit supervisor here um, in St. Michael's, Arizona. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this panel to speak on such an important issue. Um, so uh, to go a little bit more in depth. So for the Navajo Nation, family is the core of our society. Um, it is one of the fundamental principles uh, within our tribe. Um, we believe that uh, the breakup of an Indian, uh, of a Navajo family will disrupt um, our, uh, our well-being. So our, um, relationship with our family is extremely important. Um, this is where we learn who we are and where we come from. Um, part of the Navajo law, uh, it states that a Navajo child must be given the opportunity to grow up within their family system and clan relationship. This allows us to learn who we are and then find our place within this world and within our family, our community, and our tribe. And so when we start learning about who we are, um, uh, Miss Buffalo had touched upon the clan system. Um, so for the Navajo Nation, we do have a clan system. It is made up of four clans. The first one is our mother's clan. Our second clan is our father's clan. And our third clan is our maternal grandfather's clan. And our fourth clan is our paternal grandfather's clan. And so when we, um, earlier when I introduced myself, I introduced myself by stating those four clans because that allows me to immediately begin establishing kinship with other Diné people who may be in the audience or in, um, within the presence of where I'm at so that we began to establish that. Um, we believe that we are um, related, we will find relationship with other Navajo people through that clan system. So when we, when we think about that connection, it's allowing the child to give them a place of acceptance and a place of belonging, knowing that this is where I come from. These are the, the people that I'm related to. And with the clans come stories. There are songs, prayers, and stories of the creation of those clans to really connect them to again, who they are and where they belong and where they're coming from. And, it, and it's really emphasizing that connection of, um, of, the, of their well-being, but also, um, so we're, we're taught that uh, our connection to this world and to um, the holy people allows us to uh, find our place in this world. And so, and that's really coming back to the tribe and saying, this is my part and this is how I will give back to the tribe. And so through these teachings, um, as uh, 
the, the prior um, speaker had stated, a lot of this is not taught in books or in social forums. It's these conversations and these daily interactions we have with our family where we learn these things. Um, the stories of my, my clans were passed down from my grandmother. And so it, that's one of the, the examples that I can give of just how important that is, is that those stories are passed down and shared within the family. And if the child does not have a connection to the family, then they, they don't get to benefit from learning about um, those sacred stories. And then um, the other part is uh, our children are, are the carriers of our clans. They're the carriers of our stories, of our traditions, our language. And so when we don't have our children learning about that on a daily basis, they lose out on it. And so it, I don't have a guidebook that I can reference to say, oh, okay, today's lesson is on um, my first clan. What does that mean? Where is that coming from? But rather through the interactions with my grandmother, my mother, my aunts, my uncles, that's where I, I learned and, and I continue to learn. Thank you, Crescentia. That I really like that response. That was awesome. Um, when you're talking about like, you know, the stories and how we can't just like, you know, give them that guidebook. Like that's kind of how I see it because like, you know, I have my grandpa who tells me stories and I always want to sit there and like, I wish I had a recorder so I could record him and pass those stories to my kids and to their kids and so on. So that, yeah, I, that's, that's really important, I think. And teaching our children their the clan system and things like that so so thanks that was I really like that um so just kind of keeping in the um like keeping connect their children connected to their families I kind of wanted to go to this question um and this question is for Edie um so can you just kind of backtracking can you just um speak to the importance of maintaining parental rights and why guardianships are important over termination of the parental rights. My name is Edie Adams. Uh, I guess I've been in the business of working with Indian families throughout. I worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs for 33 years. Uh, I've different Indian reservations in Montana, one in Wyoming, and spent the last five years of my career in the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. Um, in answer to the question of how important it is for all tribes, for all of us to continue to work together and to band together in behalf of our Indian children is, should be at the forefront of all of our, our endeavors in our work. Uh, it is so important for each and every one of us as you all probably know, you know, the, the Blackfeet tribe and the Fort Peck tribe, the Crow tribe in Montana are the, the largest. I come from the Northern Cheyenne tribe. And back in 1980, uh, we had a referendum vote to change our enrollment from one fourth degree of Northern Cheyenne blood to, um, forgot the word, descendancy. And we were told, and they had figured it out, if we would not have done that, we would have been extinct in 50 years because our Indian blood and our enrollment regulations were making it impossible for us to have a, have a tribe. And we are located in, in Montana on a little reservation southeast uh, next to the Crow Reservation. Um, And it is very, very hard. We don't have in our in our system, the tribal system does not have an attorney hired for ICWA. And if it becomes what they consider becomes a tough case, they will reach out and, and hire an attorney for that specific case. But we do not have an ongoing attorney, which I think is very, very important for all of our cases. 
Uh, we are part and have been included in the Yellowstone County ICWA Corps. There's four tribes that have been included in that, and that is the Fort Peck tribe, the Crow tribe, and the Northern Cheyenne tribe. And in working with this group for the past four years, there have been so many new things that have developed that I feel have really, really helped the relationship between the tribes, uh, between the different agencies in the state of Montana and um, the federal government, other parts of the federal government. We now have in, in a real excellent working relationship with enrollment. And in my opinion, and I know a lot of the judges just hate to hear me say, are they enrolled? Have the enrollment papers been processed? Have the, the have they been working with enrollment on the status of these children? Because that is one of the most important items. And as you know, in Montana, it is very, there have been some changes in the state where in the past, the department would provide an uh, enrollment application for every child uh, when their application was sent to the tribe for enrollment. Now, the state has changed the regulations and it takes approximately up to six months to get an enrollment application. Um, so that may, means that in our little tribe, there are a lot of our, our kids that do not get enrolled right away. Um, and if you're not, in, you know, the regulations say if you're enrolled or enrollable, but that's part of the identity. We need to fight harder to figure out how can we get these regulations changed or how can we help these kids get their birth certificates and how can we work with the tribes to get these kids enrolled sooner than later. Uh, I think that the, uh, the culture on our tribe is coming back. I think we've had so many setbacks in our last, in, our, in the past that it's coming back and we are also proud when we see and hear our younger generations now um, learning how to speak the Northern Cheyenne language. In my era, and I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, mm -hmm. I wrapped on the knuckles if I just said, you know, one Indian word in class. And on our reservation, we had just a grade school. Um, we had a boarding school, a government run boarding school in Busby, Montana. And then we had a Catholic school in Ashland, Montana. And that's where our education was. It wasn't until just in the last, I think, 10 years that uh, the Northern Cheyenne tribe got a high school. And things are changing, but I think we really need to work. We really need to push. We need to continue working with our state counterparts and getting their help, their assistance, and seeing how important it is for our Indian children, our mothers, our fathers, grandparents. And I know we all have a hard time finding licensed foster homes on the reservation, off the reservation. And I live in Billings, Montana, and in Yellowstone County, uh, there are times I feel really bad for these workers because they really work hard to try to find Indian foster homes. Uh, we get a combination of all of the tribes coming to Billings. It's kind of the hub, uh, Billings and Great Falls. And um, it's so important that we find these homes. And I don't know, I don't have all the answers, but I think if we all keep working together, we'll come up with answers how we can find more foster homes uh, throughout Montana that we can place our kids that they will retrain their Indian culture. Thank you for that, Edie. Um, you know, uh, talking about the bringing back, you know, the language, and I know that there's some tribes that have the immersion schools, like I know the Crow tribe has it, and I think the Blackfeet tribe has an immersion, or, you know, something of that sort, trying to teach the children their, the language. Um, you know, my, my four-year-old finally is, on a school and on the reservation and she's learning the crow language which is awesome because I can sit there and 
talk with her and do our numbers together, our colors. And sometimes I, she teaches me because then I don't <laughs> say my colors that often. So I have to <laughs> remember like, oh yeah, that's what that color is. But yeah, that I think that's very important is just keeping that, that language going and our children involved in that. So thank you, Edie. Um, so I kind of wanted to just kind of go in more about um, parental rights and guardianships um, and the termination of parental rights. So I, I know Rebecca, you um, have, the Crow Tribe has a pretty large um, case, equal caseload um, and you to kind of deal with a lot of, um, you know, families in your area. So could you kind of speak more about the um, guardianships and termination of parental rights, kind of that area, if you can just kind of speak to that more and why, you know, that's important in a culture? Um, okay, what uh, I have like maybe over 200, over 200 cases with the Indian Child Welfare. And so a lot of them, you know, um, when we got back into the office about three years, two years ago, you know, uh, our attorney, she's Crow, and the, the other attorney, it's uh, she's Crow too, Elk River. And so um, I didn't transfer any cases to Crow Tribe. And then unless if um, there's family members or grandparents, that are going to get guardianship, and if their background is um, clean, and then I would transfer this case into Crow Tribal Court, and then I would give them uh, guardianship to the families. But before I do that, I go into the home, do home studies, do background check with the family, and um, you know, check everybody if there's more than two adults. We do background check on all the adults in the home. And then um, I'll, I will transfer the case to Crow Tribe and then give guardianship to families. And then, but a lot of them, um, you know, the parents, like I said, this generation, I mean, like if you come to Billings, you see a lot of young parents out in the streets, living out in the streets. So, mo most of them, the kids are in the system, so their rights has been terminated or, you know, because of that lack of communication, parents don't even make a phone call to the social workers. And so, um, you know, if they're in a good home and uh, we try to look for native family homes in Billings, and, you know, or either kinship and relative placement, then we, uh, a lot of times we do guardianship instead of adoption. But, you know, for guardianship, the parents have to relinquish their consent for guardianship. If not, if the child is in the system, then we can go forward without their consent because, you know, a lot of times we cannot find the parents, they're out in the streets and, like for the 4E department, there are times that they need to meet with the families. So, you know, we just drive around in Billings looking for these parents, you know. So, um, so the guardianship, that's what we do is to give guardianship. But, you know, um, for the past couple of years, you know, like I said, I uh, go out and look for families, try to bring them in to see if they're you know, interested in taking the child, but a lot of times that don't happen. And then so I, uh, if the child is uh, in a home, non-native home, and, you know, they'll take guardianship, but we would let them be connected with family, the reservation, and not only like bring them to Crow Fair or, but they need, that identity, they need that culture. So they have to, you know, one family we had, they were so, they did everything for this child because the child didn't have a crow name, Indian name. So this non-native, they 
went out of their way and, you know, contact an elder and had to shout, get an Indian name. And our Indian name is so important within our culture. And so, like, um, when, like, for me, I grew up in a, um, uh, in a home where my parents are, they're not really tradition, but we were brought up in like, let's see, um, rodeo family, you know, with all that. But then we still uh, have Indian names. We uh, go, you know, we have our clan system. And like I said, I'm a, you know, I, I'm, I belong to uh, Big Lodge and I'm a Taista Bundle child. And so, um, you know, I still have that and my kids have that and we have our Indian names. And so, um, you know, the guardianship, you know, we try to give guardianship to the relatives, but then if they're not, if they don't come forward, you know, and these kids have to be there in a system for what, 22 months. And a lot of them, you know, we try to look for families, you know, before they get to permanency, but you know, it's really hard to get families into this because our tribe, we have like, I think we have 18 licensed home, but a lot of them, they just want their family. They don't want other kids. So, you know, that's really hard. So we're still recruiting and we try, we like to have more foster homes and, but going into guardianship, but, you know, the Crow tribe don't really, uh, want termination on these parents to the state. They don't want that. So, so a lot of times we go to guardianship and the Crow tribe don't want to hear termination or adoption. So, but that's kind of, and I have to answer to them, you know? So, um, yeah, so that's what we do with guardianship. But, you know, I have a lot of cases that went into guardianship was non-native because there's no family for them. And, or either if I try to bring this family into the home, you know, they don't pass their background. So I'm not gonna bring a child into a home that's not safe. So, you know, so it's really hard on looking for families, guardianship with family members, extended families, you know, so, yeah, and I see that. And then on the other hand, like there's, um, um, I have nothing against, you know, non-native, but some of the foster parents that took in our children, you know, some of them are not safe in there either, you know? And I kinda, it's really hard for me to kinda support displacement where especially with the mental, you know, um, kids that have medical issues, especially the ones that are not vocal, you know? And so we have to really be careful with our children because within our tribe, you know, um, my, my elders, my grandparents told us that, you know, do not play with kids. And in other words, you know, you can't show these kids left and right with their lives. And I really take that to the heart because I have children, I have grandchildren. And my grandmother used to say that to me, don't be, you know, if a person is, don't take this child, they don't take care of it, they're abusive, you remember you have a child, but she's saying it could come back to you, to your child. And I see that in some cases. So, you know, but guardianship is, you know, we have to, um, our reservation is really big. So I go from prior to Wyola and Lodge Grass and, you know, look for families and I, you know, ask them extended families for if they would take guardianship, if the parents are not working with the department. But if that doesn't happen, then, you know, okay, then I support this current placement.
for Guardian. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, just like you said, there's a lack of the licensed homes on their reservation. So that's something I feel like is very important to our children. But thanks for the, for the information. Um, so I just kind of wanted to move on to some collaboration and communication questions. Um, and this is going to Crystal. Um, so ICWA requires the states to collaborate with the tribes. Um, so what does a meaningful consultation look like at different stages of a case? Hi, I'm Crystal Blumel, and I'm the new ICWA social worker for Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribe. I also have my supervisor in here because I've only been in my position for a couple months. So if I don't hit key points, Elizabeth will be able to expand on it. Collaboration with the state um, since I've started um, has kind of been a hit and miss. And so it's really frustrating because um, in my case files, I know where my kids are, or I think I know where my kids are. And then I will use emphasis and my kids have been placed somewhere else. And this was three times past. So having a collaboration of knowing where our kiddos are and whether they've been moved from one home to the next um, is really important that state and tribe be able to communicate with each other so that we all know where our kids are. I think it's more about being a team working with state and tribal. Um, I was going to say that I think a great barrier might be understanding the roles of each worker and of ICWA. Um, different agencies have different levels of understanding of what the purpose of ICWA is or how we will work together. I think there are certain um, opinions that maybe we work against each other. And I think it's very um, apparent that we need to make it clear that we have one voice, one goal. And regardless if we are agreeing or disagreeing on certain aspects of the case, that our goal is the same and that we listen to one another. I'm currently staffing with Crystal regarding all her cases that she works on and um, we might not agree on something, but we are able to communicate back and forth and to be able to expand that outside um, just in our work environment onto the state agencies we work with is essential. Um, I think the more clear we are on that communication, the more our ability to trust one another would be and therefore be better for our clients. Thank you, ladies, for that. Um, that's, I feel like that's very important is we're not, you know, trying to all work against each other. We're trying to, you know, we're all work towards the same goal um, when it comes to our children. Um, so I, um, um, I'm sorry, does, um, so I just kind of wanted to go to Sarah for just a little brief, like, since your, you know, tribe is newly fairly recognized and you're kind of, you know, gaining the experience of ICWA and working with the state, like, are there any specific, um, like, ideas or strategies that you kind of find helpful um, or just, you know, giving us any ways that, you know, is helpful for you, just kind of those, that input? Yeah, I mean, I think it was Rebecca that said the caseloads are really tremendous for tribes. And I think a lot of communication is really key and follow-ups because I think that's the one thing that I, I do see that is lacking is just like continual communication of what is going on. If something is moving, if the child, if something totally is different now with the birth parents or the guardianship is now doing something else, it, I think just being constantly communicated um, with the tribe is really important, and really key, especially it's a balancing act because you know, a little child tribe, we do have a lot of cases before us, 
However, uh, right now we're, we're looking for an official ICWA caseworker here in Great Falls. Um, but other than that, <laughs> yeah, yes, send me your resume. No. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we are, it, it's still like, it's a, a handful of us that are all just teaming together, trying to get our caseload work down. And, you know, honestly, if I'm not getting constant communication from someone, it does sometimes fall through the cracks. And so it is important that in order for you know, the tribe to help and of course, always for the best interest, interest of the child, you know, um, just constant communication. It's just, it's so important. And um, I do really appreciate the moving the dial, um, these trainings, because it does help us bridge some of those gaps as far as communication and ensuring that, you know, we are all here for the same reason. And we do want to do what's best for the children. Um, but then also with the aspect of ensuring that tribes also have a say in, in the placement and um, the care of these kids. And so um, that's what I would leave real quick. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so does anybody have any, you know, quick questions or comments they would like to make to the, to any of the panelists? We have about five minutes. So, so, um, having been a district court judge before, right. Um, I, th I think a lot of times courts aren't sure, like where, the, how to communicate with you all, how do we better, how, how are you all seeing that we can better open the lines of communications with, judges and the tribe and attorneys like parents attorneys and the tribe um i i know when i was in billings i had a fair amount of conversation with edie but uh other than that a lot of times we really didn't know where to go and who to contact and what your expectations for contact with us are and how we could improve that Probably a question for take hours to discuss, but I don't know if you have just any <laughs> tips <Yeah>. for any of us. <laughs> you know, uh, I was going to say that I have find, found that that seems the preference of communication or just reaching out in general is so different amongst tribes. So I can see how that can be difficult and or frustrating. Um, so I could, of course, tell you my preference, but then it's probably different from everybody else's. And I think that's another key point that, you know, we, we need to work together as tribal communities and figure out what works best for all of us. Maybe that's something that could be more, um, I like stated, you know, like amongst all of us. Well, I do think also, though, like um, judges in like your area, right, that you have most uh, contact with whatever court it is in your area, uh, certainly just having some communication there and, and working just just there to improve the communication. I think all of our judges are and ex my experiences with attorneys would be willing to do this too. We just aren't sure who the people we are to contact, what's the expectation, you know, how we could build better systems there. So I know for um, Montana, BIA has a registry with all the ICWA workers, um, the contact numbers for them. I'm, I haven't looked on there lately, but I also had them put my, I have an equal lawyer. So I had them add her name on there. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, Kelly just put it in the messages. Uh, we also have Leah has her hand up. Yeah, I'm just going to point that out. Um, yeah. Very quickly, I think for Napa Nation, I did put my contact information in the chat. Um, if you provide the child's name, date of birth, I am happy to connect you to the assigned IFA worker. I, I do staff the cases on a regular basis with my team here. So if needed, I step in to assist um, in attending any of those court hearings. Leah, did you have a question? 
No, I'm sorry. That was a mistake. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, well, thank you for all the panelists here. Um, thank you, Crescentio, for putting your information in the chat. Um, that was a lot of great information. And if anybody needs to contact them, um, you can ask them while they're here. Or if you, you didn't get a chance, I do have their contact information to provide to you all. So thanks again, everybody who um, is a part of this. All I right. have one thing to say okay. before you before you go. Um, there is a I got a link from NICWA urging all equal workers and stuff to go to Washington D.C. for that hearing. So that Dakin and is it Halen? So I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you send me that information? I will. Could okay. that information be passed to CSKT as well? Okay. Thank all you. right. Well, thank you all for uh, being willing to sit on a panel and, and come and, and share what's going on uh, with your respective tribal organizations. We are going to take a break now. Uh, my understanding is at a five minute break. Is that um, uh, Gustafson, can I interrupt? This is Julie. Sure, sure. Um, we are going to take a five minute break, but before you do, um, when we come back at 1050, we're going to put you in groups called affinity groups, and there's going to be an, a group leader. So I just want to let you know, because um, Kevin Cook, our IT person, I think will be uh, putting something up about the groups. But if, if you're a judge, you're going to go into a group called court and Judge Harada is going to be the leader of your affinity group. If you're with CFSD or a CPS, um, Deb Cole is your leader, your group leader. Um, if you're a public defender, Courtney Bagnell Moorhead will be your leader. Uh, if you're a county attorney, it's going to be Katie Handley. If you are tribal, it will be Lana Page. And if you are a GAL or CASA, it will be Drew McLeod. So you'll go into those specific groups for the, um, the next, the affinity group. What, one quick thing, Julie, oh, this is Kevin, yeah. sorry. When, after the break, for the affinity breakout rooms, um, I will hit the breakout rooms and then you have to go pick your affinity room for this one, okay? So just go to your your room. They're set up. You just have to pick the room. But it's but it's profession specific. So right. If you're a judge, you go to the court. If you're a tribal, you go. Yeah. Right. Later in the day, we're going to break out by judicial team, but this one right. by your professional specialty. So, all right. So let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll be back in about five. Is it cute? I mean, I can not have one.
All right, I think I have them all unpinned. Yep, you're good. Do you want to try um, the breakout rooms? I don't. Yeah, I can open them all up. It, it's yeah, fine. so I can I was see going, what that looks like. I was going to post something in the chat when you pick your breakout room, pick your profession, and a hyphen AG for affinity group. So hopefully they all go to the right room. So I'm going to send that right down. Open the rooms. So they should be able to go to their room. So we'll ask you as you come back to go ahead and select to join the room that uh, most of us, I think, have already been pre assigned. <laughs> not not oh. for this one. Oh, yeah, when my room, sorry to interrupt, my room says Judge Parker. And so that would be my jurisdiction. Yeah, but you want to go down to, I'm sorry. So we want to say to not now on those. Okay. Go down to your profession, please. Right. So if it's asking you to join a judge's room or whatever, say not now. Yeah, so people want to join the ones at the bottom of the list of breakout rooms. By profession. I, I guess I don't see any other breakout rooms. Where do I find those? At the bottom of the screen, there's those different commands, including the chat, and it says breakout rooms. Kelly, can you hear me? I can. Uh huh. Are they supposed to be talking about something? Uh, Judge Harada was just asking me. Yeah, so I, I put the questions on the chat. Okay, let me uh, let me open up the chat and grab those. So courtroom court. Uh, For some of you, you might have to hit on your bottom taskbar where it says more with the three dots above it. Right, and then that'll take you to breakout. Sorry, this is kind of a different way to do it than we have in the past. Um, you can only have one breakout room assigned. So that's what kind of makes it tough. So I see that there are several people who joined the judge rooms, right? Um, that's the only option it's giving me is to join the judge. Judges. Can you scroll down at all in the. Can you breakout? say not now? If I yeah, I can say not now, but there's no options on more for if me to. If you say That's not now, I think it might take you down there. I pick mine. Only asked me to join Judge Halligan, and I said not now. But now I don't have anything else to choose. Same for me. Oh, join breakout room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Where do why do I not see that? It's not giving me. It's only giving me judges. You scroll all the way to the bottom. There's no public defender one. It goes through all the judges. OPD and AG. Oh, there it is. AG. Uh, there are some, I, I, I'm, I think we're going to have some of the AG join you there. Oh, great. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> we need to find a better way to do these affinity groups. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Kevin, this is Julie, because um, Judge Davies emailed me that she's the only person in her break room and I told her to go into the well, she's in, she's probably in her judge's room that's yeah so I told her to I can I think I can move people now that I have time um let me go to find her judge oh well, I figured it out oh, okay I finally so um she... I'll go into judge best's room and ask people to join their affinity group. There's four people in there. Judge yeah. Eddie's room also has four people. 
I'll go to Judge Eddie's room. Okay, I'll go to Judge Best real quick. Oh, I think the AG sounds stands for affinity group, so not AG. Could I get a reminder where the defense attorney judges? OPD? Yeah. OPD, down at the bottom. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, did you want me, I can probably assign, let's see here. Yeah, I don't like how we did this. <laughs> hey, uh, Kevin. Yeah. I. This is Olivia Rieger. How yeah. are you? Good, good. Did you, see you want me to move you to your room? Yeah, I was... I had a, you moved me to join, to join Judge Rieger room and Cody Lensing was in there. He might be returning to this. Yeah, you need to go in this case here. You need to, you, it's kind of a new setup for us, but you needed to go to uh, your room. Way at the court. bottom. Your the room bottom. court. Yeah. For a court affinity group. Yeah. All of the affinity groups are marked with the AGs. Okay. I'm going to go to that one. Because okay. I had an invitation to join my own, and I was like, oh, right. yeah, I think that's the pre-assigned stuff taken over, so. Okay, I'm going to get into this one. Okay. I think we're pretty close to getting most people. Yeah, I'm hoping when we do the, the team rooms that we don't okay. yeah. have the same issue now. We might. I think we only have a few people left. Welcome to Zoom. Enter your new oh, line, followed by town. Mine is really weird. So this is Shelby, but it's showing that my name shows Deb for some reason. And okay. It popped, it popped me to a breakout room that said Deb. And then I was like, nobody's in there. And then it kicked me out. So, and then now okay. it your, so your link from uh, Deb by chance? Yeah, I did. Yeah, use so, that's, so you're using her link. So the links are set to. If you first. scroll all the way down can you see the rooms if you scroll all the way down to cps cfsd affinity dash you. ag for affinity group uh, and i'll rename you to who you should be what was your name again shelby goodman so in the hold on We're very close to getting everybody open it. Do you have, uh, can you bring up the breakout rooms? No, I, okay. it's not showing me anything. Okay, so Kevin's going to need to just move you into a breakout room yeah, then. I to find you here. And uh, you have the right name now, Kevin. So, yeah. Yeah. So okay. Waiting room. So, okay. I'm going to add her. Oops, I goofed her up here. I shouldn't have done that. Sorry. All right. Uh, um, well, Kevin, I'm going to go to the yeah, court one. Ahead. I think you've got everybody. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I just got to add Shelby here. Sorry, okay. Shelby. I kind of, let's get you added to where I need you to go. Okay. Unassigned, unassigned. I just, there you are. So move to, and who do you go to, Shelby? Um, so I'm a child and family services, so I would go, okay. I'm sure, to Deb. So CF, CPS, CF. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you moving? Yep, there you go. 
Hey, did you need to go to a certain room? Uh, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, the CPS one. I just got booted out completely, so I'm trying to rejoin. So CPS room? Okay, yeah. I'll add you in there. Maybe I will. Let's see, where are you? Are you? For some reason, I'm not seeing you. There you go.
uh, I, am I still on there? <laughs> You're still on, but I think we're out of the breakout rooms. So we'll just um, address it in the fishbowl. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. All right. So I think we have everybody uh, back and uh, I think the next thing on our agenda is called push, fishbowl conversation or is that uh, contemplated to be the report out period? Is that, do I have that correct? Yes. And so Heather, are you gonna like ask various groups to do that? Yeah, I sure will. Um, so if we wanted to maybe start um, with the tribal group, I see Yolanda on there. Um, and Lana, I think you were the designated um, leader. <laughs> um, and just wondering if you have um, items to report back from um, from the group discussion. And I think the designated question for everyone had been, how does your tribe participate in our ICWA cases? How does your tribal law and order code and or tribal policies and procedures address ICWA cases in state district court? So. So yeah, um, I, I believe that all the tribes that were present in the um, affinity group, pretty much we had the same similar um, processes and codes, um, which is pretty normal, I think, and standard for tribes is that we've always pretty much, I think, had taken the adoption of some of those codes and are revising them as we have gone through the years, but um, pretty much standard where, you know, we do the basic um, intervention and all the different um, things. And when we have emails that come in, you know, informally from social workers where we can get a jump start on trying to be involved in the cases and they keep us referred. Um, the only difference I believe is, um, you know, I think for us and, and, and appears from in discussion with the others is that CSKT has um, probably the, the most um, where we've, do our descendancy and intervene on the descendancy. Um, the Blackfeet, um, Crow and Northern Cheyenne appeared that, you know, limitations on funding have put kind of, and through the BIA that they're not available to do that and haven't done that because of that limitation. And they just don't have the workers also to come in and do that. So it's kind of been a barrier for them to reach the descendancy um, members, um, our associate members, I'm assuming for Fort Peck, that they um, just can't um, deal with the caseload with that, with what they have now and um, the, the funds for it. Um, we have been able to do that um, in ways that, you know, because we try to keep most of ours are transferring to um, the tribal court system, I believe in being ahead of those um, for us, but we have always just had that in our code to follow it that we have to, um, you know, include descendancies into ours. And if their parents are enrolled tribal members, then we do that. Um, the only other thing that I've seen as a problem that, you know, I've encountered and um, I asked a question of others is that when um, in our processes is that we, as the ICWA um, personnel within the tribes, um, kind of our unit is that we usually work with enrollment ourselves. And sometimes we've had social workers that have come in and bypassed us um, and work and go directly to the enrollment themselves and not working within our ICWA units within the tribes first. And they kind of bypass us and go directly to enrollment. So that has become an issue and a problem, I think, with um, regards to whether we intervene in cases or whether we enroll and how we enroll um, some of our kids. Um, I think Rebecca just kind of got um, cut off because we're, our time ended in regards to, you know, dual enrollment with different tribes and how that would work when a social worker has fully enrolled um, the children because they were able to be enrolled in two different tribes. So I think that's one of the things that we had seen, um, you know, our processes are pretty much the same. I may think they're evolving um, for each and every tribe. Um, like I said, I th but I think we have gone about it um, similarly. Um, with finding that median and trying to intervene and work with social workers through the state. And, you know, I think with us, there's turnover or there's people that retire or leave within the tribes. So it's, 
you know, hard to keep that communication as to what the judge, I think, referred to earlier um, in saying that we need to, who do we contact within the tribes and maybe we just need to find a better way um, to maybe communicating as a tribal um, Liz and with us tribes and making sure we know the contact person for each of us too. So then we can communicate that to the state courts um, if a case comes up. That's one of ours. And Edie's been pretty good about that with me in Yellowstone County. When she sees that, she knows that but CSKT, she will give me a call and say, I think this is one of yours. You need to be on that. So it's been good for that. So that's kind of where we um, discussed in our affinity group. Awesome. Thank you, Lana. Um, next to, how about we go to parents council? So I believe that Courtney um, was the leader of this or, or will be reporting back. Um, and the primary question that was asked was, in what ways can communicating with the tribe benefit your client? And can you include your client in that partnership? So, um, Courtney? Yeah. So we had some awesome conversations. And I think one of them that came out of the eastern side of the state was the kind of that idea of the tribe providing some additional services and some, you know, additional things that parents can do on their treatment plan or in not even additional, but services that maybe they don't offer there within the city or town, but that the tribe can offer. And I think that kind of, you know, is directly impacts how the client can participate and how the try how the client can be involved with that. Um, some other conversations that we had were oftentimes, um, you know, some of the potentially some of the C CFS workers and maybe sometimes even the county attorneys don't have maybe those connections with the tribes that perhaps um, some of the defense attorneys may have or some of the parents, excuse me, parents attorneys may have along with their clients. And so oftentimes we can get those conversations kind of going and then even provide that information to county attorney or you know whoever it is that is, um, if it's a contract attorney that's stepping in for the state. Um, and then another one was also too, oftentimes going directly to the tribe can provide us with maybe additional um, placement options that maybe the parents hadn't considered, maybe opening up um, maybe some lost familial connections that, um, you know, parents have had there all along, but have not remained in contact with. And so oftentimes it could open up the potential for additional placements. And then um, one of the other final conversations that we kind of had was um, oftentimes it can provide going directly to, for instance, like the QEWs can provide that narrative from the parent's perspective and not potentially just from coming from the state or coming just from CFS, that they can get kind of that both sides of the story. So obviously you have why the child was initially removed, but then you're also providing the parents narrative on what they've been doing on what it's been like for them and how they're doing and, and kind of, again, just opens up that um, better understanding from the tribe's perspective because they're getting that narrative from parents too. So I, again, awesome, awesome conversations. And unfortunately we kind of ran out of time and didn't get to go into as much of the, um, the partnership with parents, but I think kind of every single one of those discussions that we had really involves the parent directly. So again, great, great conversations. Awesome. Thank you, Courtney. And I, Agree. It was really nice to be in our affinity groups to talk to our peers in our areas of practice. Mm -hmm. um, if we can go to judges, Judge Harada, I believe you're the leader of the judge group. And um, the question for the judges was, what does tribal participation look like in your cases in courtroom? How do ICWA cases look different in your courtroom? 
and um, has the ICWA bench card helped you at all? Yeah, so I will start by saying in Yellowstone County, we have um, Judge Sousa's ICWA court, which is, um, I think, uh, an amazing asset, and he has a, a great amount of tribal involvement. Um, and then Judge Davies also has her ICWA court that is three of the smaller tribes. And um, the point of those courts is to try to include collaboration from tribes and make it known that they are uh, willing to build relationships with the tribes. Um, I also have ICWA cases. I don't see as much tribal involvement in my ICWA cases, but we always enjoy tribal involvement and appreciate whatever we can, uh, whatever assistance we can get from the tribe or in whatever involvement they would like to have. Um, second question was uh, how do ICWA cases look differently from non-ICWA cases? Um, obviously it looks different because there is a higher standard and a higher burden of proof. Um, we talked all, quite a bit about what that means and how that looks and are we just paying lip service to it or are we really dialing down into it and making sure that the parties can prove um, and meet those burdens. And so um, it, it's important to us that we spend a little bit extra time on making sure that um, there is active efforts and especially with placement preferences, that um, is something that we spend more time on. Also, uh, placement preferences can be a bit challenging for judges, as was mentioned before the example that um, think Brooke and Heather gave about a, a child being bonded with um, uh, a foster placement or um, someone and then having um, to be removed to um, honor the ICWA requirements uh, for placement preferences. And so that can be really hard on a kid and we recognize that and we um, certainly um, struggle with those decisions. Um, let's see, we talked a little bit about how ICWA is the gold standard. We all wish ICWA was uh, for every case and we wish every uh, child had these opportunities to recognize their culture and their backgrounds. And it's just a, a, a really wonderful um, opportunity to be able to um, make sure that kids have an understanding of their heritage and who their family uh, members are. We talked about how um, Bob has, Bob. Judge Whalen, um, excuse me, Judge Whalen has um, quite a few ICWA cases in Butte and uh, he gets a little bit of tribal involvement with uh, the help of Zoom. So Zoom has assisted us with making sure that tribes can engage a little bit easier as opposed to having to travel across our giant state. And um, one of the problems that um, Judge Whalen mentioned that I have also noticed, um, not probably not as prevalent as Judge Whalen, but sometimes we have people who don't bring up the fact that this is an ICWA case until many months into the case. And that can be a challenge um, for everyone because you know we want to meet the, the requirements for ICWA cases. And, take care of placement preferences and making sure that active efforts are made. Um, but if we don't know about it, even if we ask the question and the question still is no, this is a non equa case, um, looking a little bit uh, deeper at that situation uh, might be needed either by the social workers or uh, counsel for the parents. Um, let's see, we also use bench cards uh, that are very helpful and we all utilize those. We all agree that those are a really great resource. And if the attorneys wanted to see the bench cards, they are available. So it might give you, um, judges should be at every hearing per the regs. Yeah, we are at every hearing. Somebody wrote in the chat, judges should be at every hearing. We're at every hearing. Um, but if you ever wanted to see the bench cards, it might be helpful for you all to know what we could be asking. So, oh, and one more thing. Um, Judge Whalen did mention that this is really great training that might be um, of assistance for brand new social workers and um, caseworkers because they um, might just, they might not uh, be aware of the expectations that are um, 
associated with ICWA cases. Um, now the chat says asking about Indian child status. Uh, we always ask about if this is an ICWA or non-ICWA case, but sometimes we don't receive um, an answer that it is an ICWA case, even though we're asking and then we find out months later that it is an ICWA case. So um, sometimes that information is not brought forward at the beginning. And so I'm responding to Tracy Rhodes um, chat. So that was it. Awesome. Thank you, Judge. And yeah. it's always interesting to hear how different jurisdictions in our state handle things. Yeah. Um, Deb, I'm coming to you next on the social worker questions. Um, which were, how do you engage the tribes during each stage of the case? What are some takeaways from the tribal panel? Um, and what, you know, from their feedback might you incorporate into your practice? Perfect, thanks, Heather. So we talked a little bit, well, we talked a lot about um, how we are broken into regions and some regions um, have a lot of, um, have a lot of, what I'm trying to say, I'm sorry, do a lot of ICWA cases where some are not quite at, have as many ICWA cases coming through their courts. So um, one of the things that we talked about is how um, caseworkers try to reach out to the tribe, give that notice right away, send emails um, right away when they get the cases, supervisors being better at making sure that workers are including tribes, not just one specific person, but you know multiple areas, um, working with our county attorneys. We know that those um, notifications also go out with them. One of the difficulties that everyone kind of talked about is that it is there's a lot of changes. And even when we try to keep up on the phone numbers or who we are to contact, we sometimes don't do the best that we can because of all of the changes and that we need to find ways to do um, better at that. Um, we talked about the active efforts and really having that compassion part of it and really spending time with the parents on what their needs are and having continued ongoing conversations with our um, tribal partners about wishes, needs of families, what we can provide that we might be missing. Sometimes we feel like we may be addressing all those active efforts. And then when we talk to our ICWA, uh, ICWA experts, we've missed a lot of things. So those ongoing conversations, need to continually be happening, and we're not necessarily doing that as well as we can. Recognizing as an agency that some areas have really good relationships with the tribes and how can we use each other? So if we have something going on with a tribe in the Great Falls area that we are having a struggle in getting information or contacting someone, how we can use our own, agency, our people in the Great Falls offices to help us connect because they do have those relationships because they're doing it more. Um, the Billings area, the tribes that we have those relationships, Eastern, the Western, all across the state, and really trying to overall improve our communication amongst ourselves, amongst our tribal partners, um, and really focusing on how can we help the tribes and how can the tribes help us because we're all trying to do the best thing um, for the children. We found in listening to the panel and a lot of the discussions, one of the things that really stood out to everyone was the, um, the not fighting over children and us not recognizing that that might be reasons for people not stepping mm -hmm. up uh, or attending meetings as we talked about. Um, some areas, Billings has a, a monthly meeting with our tribal partners to try to talk about cases. Not everybody has those. Everybody kind of has a different way of doing that, which I think some work great, some we want to improve on. Um, whether or not our tribal partners are attending like PPTs to help identify firm placements, our FEMs in some areas, it sounds like they do quite a bit, some they don't. So really kind of honing in on where we're missing and what the what we could do to engage the tribes more in those areas. Um, the other thing that kind of resonated to us is when they talked about um, 
how they have children placed all over the country when we're just really focusing on our Montana kids and we sometimes tend to forget about all of the other things they're having to focus on as well. Um, so that we felt was pretty eye-opening to us. Um, and really finding out a really good system for us to notify the tribes when we remove kids and getting on top of that right away. Um, some areas have those pre-hearings. So if, if we miss things at the beginning, usually we can connect with our ICWA experts and our tribal members then, but just having a really good system to help us continue those communications, um, whether it's to do better by adding emails, whatever that correspondence looks like so that it, the communication um, is good and going both ways on a regular basis. Awesome, thank you, Deb. Um, I know we're running into our group time, but I really wanna hear from the GAL CASA group. And so I'm making an executive decision that we're going to do that. Um, and partly because I was part of the county attorney conversation, um, sorry, Katie, I know you've been a designated person, but I'd like to hear from Drew um, about the questions that we had asked regarding the Indian children, because I think advocacy for them, obviously, that's who we're focused on in these cases. So the questions were, what are ways in which you have or can advocate for a child's connection, ongoing connection with tribe and family? What are questions I could ask in every um, court proceeding to facilitate those connections? And in what ways did the tribal panel um, impact some ways that you can incorporate that? Sure. I think we uh, did a good job on the first two questions uh, and the third one kind of fell off for us. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just continuing to ask those questions, uh, to reach out, uh, make your own relationships with the tribes as well. Not, uh, not in the role of a CPS, but uh, also just, just making those connections as well. Relying on your uh, qualified ICWA expert in your community. You know, as far as connection to, uh, you know, culture and family, uh, is there an Indian education for all uh, educator in your neighborhood uh, or in your region that you can connect to? Uh, we talked a lot about in the reports that CASAs do, uh, gently reminding the court that this is a APA case or not, uh, and reminding the court, uh, are they in a preferred placement or not, and why or why not. So uh, again, just, uh, you know, kind of a friend friendly reminder, uh, looking for informal connections. So those day to day connections, and that, I think, goes back to, uh, you know, asking questions, getting to know the family, um, you know, it, checking in with a qualified uh, expert. Uh, offer to facilitate connections as well. Uh, sometimes we know that CPS is very busy. Uh, you know, is there a way that the CASA can, you know, uh, be involved in that to facilitate that? Um, I think uh, the panel as well for us uh, I'm going to speak for the group without us having discussed a lot of, about it. Uh, was eye opening uh, and confirming as well. We uh, appreciate how important it is uh, to remain, uh, continue, continue with those connections uh, and to continue to involve the tribe. So being persistent, continue to reach out, uh, you know, expand who you're visiting with uh, and invite them in. I think those were the the major highlights on on the CASA awesome. GAL discussion. Awesome, thank you, Drew. Mm -hmm. I think um, maybe we'll hear from the county attorneys as well. It sounds like um, Nikki wants to hear, and so let's make sure we talk about the county attorneys breakout as well. Um, and. Um, Catherine Hanley is um, reporting back, and the questions had to do with, um, does our jurisdiction utilize affidavits in which the tribe's position is stated in the social worker's affidavit? Is the tribe's position stated in your petition? Um, if not, is there anything preventing us from doing that? And then um, what inquiries as a 
can you make um, on the record so that the tribe's voices are heard? I know we talked about other things as well. So Katie, take it away. Okay, and I'll, I'll keep it super brief because I know we're short on time. So it sounds like across the board, it's pretty rare for initial filings to have the tribe's position. Uh, the affidavits are filed very quickly anymore. And most of us, I think, have the five-day hearings that are, are going on in the majority of our cases at this point. So it, it's difficult often to get in touch with the tribe um, because we often don't know which exact tribe it is. A lot of times we'll be told we may have affiliation to a Sioux tribe. So we're reaching out to 15 different tribes. That can be very difficult to get responses back in the short period of time we have to file things. So in those initial petitions, often not. But as soon as we have a tribe identified, which is a lot quicker when we have a specific tribe that we know is affiliated and takes a little longer if we have sort of a category of tribes that are reaching out to several. Once a tribe's been identified, their positions are, sounds like across the board included in the affidavits and petitions. And a lot of times the county attorney's role is really to support the caseworker in making sure that the efforts to reach out to the tribes are part of that affidavit and make sure that the tribe's position is clear in the affidavit so, so the judge is aware of sort of where we're at. Um, it also sounded like across the board, judges were doing a really good job when the case, when the uh, tribal representative was present at the hearing to give that individual the chance to sort of state the tribe's position, ask any questions, make any comments that they'd like to make, which is great. I think one of the most important things we talked about was at the very end, which had to do with implementing more multidisciplinary groups and conversations to really get the tribe's position more well known. And that sort of came across several different avenues. In Missoula, it was the staffing that ICWA representatives were invited to prior to court on Thursdays, or I believe on Mondays, their staffing was Thursdays, perhaps. Um, in Great Falls, they did have meetings with the local tribe sort of once a month staffing um, cases with that tribe, which I think is awesome. And then in Flathead, we try to implement regular family engagement and treatment team meetings for cases when there, there's questions or the families are needing help. And we do try to invite the tribal representatives to those things as well when we have an identified tribe. So we did talk about sort of trying to implement more of those meetings and make in helping to make the communication more regular with our tribal partners. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I think maybe what we can do, and Justice Gustafson, I know you're going to do the wrap up, but I think okay. maybe tomorrow we can incorporate some of what we've learned today into our team breakouts. Um, we have some specific questions that we can discuss in our teams tomorrow. And then in addition, um, some of these takeaways, I really loved hearing from each group and how I think the more we're connected with um, our own counterparts around the state, um, like Deb was mentioning, like when we have questions and we know that people are more engaged with different tribes because of their work in different parts of the state, how helpful that can be. So um, Justice Gustafson, if you wanted to wrap us up since we only have 10 minutes. Left. Sure. <laughs> sure. Well, we used up some of our team time to hear breakouts. Uh... And I think that was uh, worth it. So we're going to kind of uh, change that. And like uh, Heather said, we'll have a little longer time for team breakout tomorrow. I guess because we have a couple extra minutes, is there anything from anybody's group that wasn't mentioned that they just really wanted to share right now? Because now's your opportunity to take two minutes to do that. Well, I don't hear anyone piping up, so uh, I want to thank everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. Gustafson, this is um, Lana Page from the Tribal. I just wanted to iterate Great. that. I wanted to just make it come across that I think um, Edie in the beginning of our discussion was talking about maybe potentially doing like even a tribal um, little small organization where we can provide, you know, getting... Um, just us involved to kind of like it was talked about with the social workers and others and county attorneys, just to have somewhat of a, um, like I said earlier, to have a conduit so that we could have a communication. If one tribe's not there, then we could have um, somewhat of a contact for that tribe or an updated one just to keep us involved with each other also um, as a tribe to make sure that we can 
have some type of, you know, um, if we're not, if the, we're not able to be at a hearing and they have been, or they hear something, then they can assist us also. So, and we can Excellent. provide that to the state social workers and county attorneys. Well, that would be excellent because I think uh, I think all of us here are really wanting to build some better relationships and uh, more communication with uh, the tribal folks so that we can all do a better job with regard to our child welfare work. I want to thank everyone for participating this morning. We uh, are going to start up tomorrow morning. Uh, tomorrow we are going to talk about qualified expert witnesses and dispositions, have some time for uh, team breakouts and uh, getting some plans on how uh, we can each improve our child welfare work going forward. Uh, tomorrow, I think it, our schedule says we're on from uh, eight to noon or something. I think the plan is really 8.30 to 12.30. So if you could log on a few minutes before 8.30 so that we could get going then, uh, we will we'll get We'll get going. We have lots on the agenda for tomorrow. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Again, thank you for your participation today.